Sassy V Worldwide Productions. With over 25 years of entertainment experience, we have done it all. Celebrity appearances, red carpet events, image consultation and branding design. Our clients range from American football stars to Hollywood celebrities and everyone in between. Want to make a splash in the entertainment industry? Then it's time to get sassy. SassyBeeWorldwide.com You're listening to ABA One-on-One Podcast. Hey guys, it's time for a new episode of ABA One-on-One. Open up, uh, yeah. Open up now. Open up. Open up, yeah. Open up, open up, open up now. I give a damn doc, give him a bone, give a damn doc a bone. I give a damn doc, give him a bone, give a damn doc a bone. I give him a bone. Welcome back to another ABA one-on-one. Today we got Brian and Rick in the house and special guest Dan Panaggio. Man, this is going to be a good one, everybody. Uh, Dan, welcome to ABA one-on-one, brother. Oh, thank you, CJ. I'm glad to be here. Good, good, good. And uh, Rick, we'll let you jump on in, my brother. Well, I got a lot of things I want to talk to him about. So I'm, I'm Imagine very... that. Imagine that. As part, <laughs> I, again, I want to welcome him and thank him for, for doing this for me because he's, uh, I consider him a very good friend. And uh, I want to just talk a little bit about your early early career, uh, Dan. I know about your dad, playing for your dad and whatnot in college at Brockport. Is that right? New York University of Brockport? Uh, yeah, that's a uh, State University of New York at Brockport. Yeah, they call those the SUNY schools in New York. Yes. Right. Now you played for your dad there and then you went on to coach with him. Is that, is that right? I, I did, but uh, actually I'd even like to just back up just a little bit. When I was growing up, my brother Mike and I, who we, we ended up being college teammates uh, playing for my father, but we grew up in uh, Rochester, New York. Uh, and my father was an inner city high school coach uh, when we when we were young and we would uh, we basically grew up in a locker room, the two of us. So uh, it was natural to follow my father uh, when he, you know, after I played high school basketball and he was named uh, 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 a coach at State University of New York at Brockport. Uh, it was just natural for both my brother and I to follow him there. And uh, my brother was two years ahead of me, but we both we both uh, played for him uh, all four years of college. Yes. Wow, that's that's great. That is unbelievable. I said I knew your dad very well too, as well as I would like to know him. I spent a lot of time with him. But you know, the great stories of going into the CBA and whatnot. But uh, talk to us a little bit about the CBA, Dan. Where how you got into the CBA? Well, how I got in is this was actually goes back again to Rochester, New York. My father was had left uh, the college scene and had taken a job in, uh, at that time, it was called the Eastern League. Um, and so he, he coached in the, in the Eastern League, and then it became called the, uh, the Continental Basketball Association. And, uh, and uh, I was uh, just coming out of college, and uh, he needed an assistant coach. Well, I was a high school coach at one of the, the local uh, Catholic high schools, uh, but he was operating on a low budget, so I might have been the only guy uh, in history that was coaching two teams uh, at one time. I was a, a high school varsity basketball coach, and then I would also uh, assist him with his uh, Continental Basketball Association team. And then one time when he, this is uh, at the same time when he got low on numbers because they were only allowed an eight-man roster, so if they had an injury or two, he had to pick somebody up. So I, not, I was coaching a high school team, assistant coaching his team, and then he had to add me to the roster, and I actually played three or four games while uh, he was injury plagued uh, in the in the Continental League. <laughs> awesome! Oh, wow, <laughs> that, awesome. that's amazing. I didn't know that. That's great. Yeah, and and at the same time, I was taping ankles 
and uh, and and all the rest of it because uh, I, I served as the trainer as well for part of that time. Wow, oh. a man of many traits, huh? Well, that. back in those days, you had to. You didn't have the budgets, and uh, you know teams were uh, all you know financially strapped, at, at least in that league. Uh, but it was a great league with great players, great coaches. Very yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think the CBA. I actually played in that league uh, for a season. You played in that league? Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Where, where did you play? I played for the uh, Topeka Sizzlers. Um, <laughs> but that was, you know, I don't know, what year was that? I think that was 1980, 89 or 89, 90, yeah. somewhere around there. 1989, yeah, yeah, I think the, it was. I the, played with the Topeka Sizzlers that year. Yeah, Topeka, Kansas. I remember that very small town very well. Uh, they were in our league, and uh, I spent uh, a lot of years in that league. I think I spent total 12 years in that league. Well, maybe 13 years in that league. And uh, I spent uh, three as an assistant to my father, and then I was a, a head coach in that league uh, for nine years. And you won how many champions? Mm. Wow. Uh, uh, we won. We won two championships uh, with the, you know that was uh, they were both with the Quad City Thunder, uh, and we played uh, in Moline, Illinois. Wow! Wow! Okay. Okay. See, that's uh, that's that's some great history. Yeah, yeah. and uh, there was some great there was some great coaches. Phil Jackson. Uh, can you guys still hear me? Yeah, yeah we can. We're good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Phil Jackson, of course, uh, was coaching in that league and George Carl, Flip Saunders, Mike Tebow, uh, Eric Musselman, Bill Musselman, uh, really, really uh, very good coaches in that league. So it was always a, uh, quite a challenge every night. Uh, you know, you were going against somebody that you better be totally prepared for. Wow. Wow. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. amazing. But you know, you know, Dan, we, um, this whole show, this whole thing is through the ABA and the ABA was, I'm sure had a lot of similarities to the CBA in terms of budgets, in terms of travel, in terms of characters. Because so, um, I know yeah. I talked to your dad a lot about some of the guys that played for him and it, it was, it was hilarious to hear some of those stories. Oh yeah. I think every CBA coach, uh, you know, could write a book about some of the characters and some of the experiences that we had because it was, they were all tight budgets, but really good basketball players. Uh, many of them uh, ended up, you know, in the, in the NBA, uh, but just had to pay their dues. And, and, you know, it's not just coaches and players that made their way through that, those tough environments to the NBA, but uh, just about every, uh, known referee, uh, you know, until the, the, you know, the start of this, uh, this e league, which is now called the G league up until that point, just about every referee had gotten his start in the old continental basketball association. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Um, I know when, uh, Isaiah Thomas bought that league, um, I think that was the beginning of its downfall, if I'm not mistaken. But it's um, it's notorious. Some of the some of the players that went through there, it was it was uh, because most, like you said, most of those guys did end up in the NBA. A lot of them did. I don't say most of them, but a lot of them did. Yeah, I th think Isaiah bought the yeah. bought the league in 1998 or 1999, and I spent one year uh, working uh, in Isaiah's uh, league. And then I said, you know, it's time to get out because I could see the, uh, the writing on the wall. So I jumped ship and I went to uh, Indiana University. Uh, Bobby Knight had just gotten fired. And uh, one of my, a couple of my close friends were Mike Davis and John Trelor. And so uh, they asked <laughs> me. To and so I, I, I jumped ship and I, I said, I'll, I'll, go, I'll try the college game. Yeah, that was that was you know, you know it's funny that you nice to talk about the college game a little bit because I know you were in in that round for for what one year? How many years were you in college, Dan? Well, I I was in uh, 
college, uh, in junior college, but uh, I spent one year at Indiana, and then my one of my former assistants, uh, a great former player by the name of Maurice Cheeks, he was named uh-huh. the head coach of the Portland Trailblazers, and so uh, Maurice called me up, and, and of course, I was gone in quick order because I always wanted to, to be an NBA coach, so uh, I, I, I went from Indiana to, uh, to Portland and spent the next four years with the Trailblazers. Maurice G. Oh. Lawyer. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's, Maurice, it's, it's Maurice you, he was a great player. Uh, uh, Dan, it's, it's funny that you mentioned Mike Davis um, because I actually played with Mike Davis. Uh, we were on the same team in the, in the CBA at, um, at Topeka. And, and that guy there was a defensive demon. I mean, uh, <laughs> some of the stories I could tell you about Mike Davis on his defense, that guy was just unbelievable when he locked players down. But I want to ask you yeah, a the, question, you know, he, he, go, go ahead, please. Go ahead, go ahead, please. No, you go. You go. I'm just, I'm just sorry. I'm just getting a delay. I'm getting a delay for some yeah. reason over here. Yeah, yeah, you got a small delay, Brian. The COVID. Is it? Yeah, it's COVID, <laughs> COVID yeah. the COVID. <laughs> Blame right, everything on COVID. All right, Brian. Brian, go ahead. Ask your question, Brian. Okay. <laughs> now, I just wanted to, I, I mean, because you, Dan, you got, you got a lot of experience, man, and, and you've been around the game for a long time. And I, I noticed as a part of your resume, you spent some time in China uh, and coaching over there. Could you elaborate a little bit more on, say, the Chinese League? because we've had a few yeah. guests on before that had some stories about it. So, yeah. Yeah. I never thought I would do this. Uh, I never had any desire, uh, but I was, uh, I was the director of um, uh, pro scouting for the Phoenix Suns and quite happy there. And uh, I got a call from uh, Yao Ming's agent. Uh, Yao Ming had uh, just retired mostly because his, he had a series of foot injuries and he was such a big guy that it was if he was to keep playing, uh, he was going to sacrifice, uh, you know, his overall safety, health and safety with that foot. But uh, but uh, Yao Ming had purchased a team in Shanghai. That's his hometown. Uh, quite a large town at that. Um, and yeah. uh, and his agent, uh, Bill Duffy, called me and offered me uh, a job coaching the Shanghai Sharks. And I said, no, I'm, I'm really quite happy in the NBA here. It was my dream always uh, to, to be an NBA coach and, and, and front office guy and all the rest of it. I, I'm just going to stay. Well, he said, okay. And then uh, he must have gone back to Yao and, and they called me back about a week later and said, look, we really want you. And they, they made the, uh, the money so good. It was money that, uh, you know, even – surpassed what I was making in the, uh, in the NBA. And I, I just, I said, this is just too good. And, uh, he offered me a three-year deal. And so off I went to China and, uh, I found, uh, Chinese basketball, very, very different. Uh, it was, um, <laughs> there's, there's such a, and the, the American players, uh, in that league, I think my, I think my first year there, was the year, I think it was 2000 and maybe 12 or 2011. But at any rate, there was an NBA lockout. And during the NBA lockout, yeah. what ended up happening was, oh, I'd say a, a, maybe almost a dozen NBA players uh, went over to China and they played in the league. And there was such a discrepancy between these NBA, bona fide NBA players and the Chinese players that, you know, guys were scoring, you know, 40 and 50 points a ball game. Uh, so it made it very difficult. Uh, you know, the whole th- coaching in there is, is a real, uh, real experience. Let me tell you, a real experience. Well, you know, Dan, <laughs> I, was in, I was there in Hangzhou in, I think, 04, 03, 04. I took over for a coach who had gotten sick, and I was coached the last half of the season. And when I was there – you had limits. I had a guy sit on the bench with me. You could, you could only play your Americans a certain amount of minutes together. 
And so you always sit there, and I couldn't keep up with the minutes. So he, I put him in charge of can you remember? I want my best players on the floor the last last half of the game, last part of the game. Mm-hmm. That was it. Was yeah. in there. I'm not sure they're still doing that, but at the time, you could only play certain minimum of minutes for the America. Or yeah. The- well, they. Yeah, they always they were changing the rules, you know, year by year. When I was there, uh, you were allowed two Americans and they could play. uh, They could play. uh, I believe they could play all four quarters. uh, And then um, except if you were playing the army team and the army team, I think it was called by and they had no Americans, but they had but they had the very best Chinese players. Uh, a couple yeah. of them had a little, little cup of coffee in the NBA. And so in those games, you were only allowed to play one uh, of your Americans on the floor at any one time. Hey, Dan, was uh, was was Stefan Marbury there then when you were playing? When yeah. you were coaching? Yes. Yes, um, Stefan was there. He, he was with Beijing. And, uh, uh, and as a matter of fact, I think my first year there, Beijing won the uh, championship and they also call their league CBA, the Chinese basketball association. So he, he was uh, obviously uh, absolutely adored by uh, everybody in Beijing. And so uh, he, it was, it was very difficult to beat them on their home court, but we did beat them on our court. So uh, wow. we were able to, uh, to beat them that year. We were surprising uh, they named me coach of the year my first year there. And uh, we had taken wow. our team that, that had pre- previously, I think, won four or five games. And uh, when I took over my first year, we were fortunate enough. We, uh, we finished sixth in the league and we went to the playoffs. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I know they, um, they looked at Stephon's being kind of like uh, their, their Michael Jordan. Like they have a statue for him and everything over there. I always thought that was pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah they did they they built a statue uh to him i think uh you know a couple of years and you know the chinese uh culture i think uh, i i can safely say that they're a copycat culture and mm, so yeah. th- they see what what happens here in the u.s and they just try to copy it they mm. do it in in business and they do it in athletics so since michael jordan had a statue well, that was their Michael Jordan, like uh, Brian, like you said. So uh, they went ahead and built him the statue. Wow. <laughs> you, you, you know, Dan, Dan one of, of the, uh, you know, go ahead, Rick. One of, the, one of the most interesting things that I found in China, and I, I know, was about the, your inter, interaction with the referees. Um, it, with the fans, you know, stuff is very disrespectful to get on the referees. And I thought, what a contrast between that and the NBA. But when I was there, you know, you just didn't, you didn't get on the referee. That was, I did a little bit. I kind of said they didn't, they didn't speak English, I don't think, so it didn't really matter. But I thought that was very yeah, interesting. Yeah. Referees. Well, it's very, you know, it's very hard not to get on those referees <laughs> because, number one, number one, they're not very talented. And number two... Uh, I, I, I hate to say this, but, uh, they're not very honest and, uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah. they could, at least in those days, they could easily be bought mm. and they were bought. Mm. Well, uh, yeah, I can, I can definitely attest to that. Dan, yeah. um, I took yeah. a group of players over to China back in 2016 and we were playing at the, 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 the CBA Academy that they have there um, that, and I guess they call it the NBA Academy, but it was like the CBA MBA slash Academy. And we were playing a game and uh, I'll never forget this one referee. His name was uh, Mr. Yoon was his name. And uh, Mr. Yoon accepted a few bribes <laughs> wow. in order yeah. to uh, make some calls against the team that I brought over. And that was brought to my attention by, um, uh, who was that at the time? Not Brian Gorgian. Uh, Jesus. Um, He ran the academy there. Uh, He used to be here for a while, Australian guy. Uh, Jesus, I just have a a mental blank. I forgot we went over there, man. 
Well, you know, remember he used to, he actually used to coach the Giants here. Um, he's an American kid, um, not Bill Maher. Uh, Jesus, I'm just having a mental blank right now. But he runs the uh, basketball academy over there, and uh, he came to apologize after our game because of Mr. Yoon taking a few bribes. So I I I can relate to what you're saying there, Dan. That much is for certain. Yeah, part, it was part of the, it's part of their culture actually, uh, and so it's generally not the the coaches that are involved in this, but the owners. When the referees come into town the night before, uh, you know it's culture. <laughs> you 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 take them out for 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 food and and drink, and and the next day, uh, you know you're in good shape. And uh, the, it's almost <laughs> always the, the the home team. But uh, very difficult to win on the road there. You got to be about twenty points better uh, to win on the road. Wow! Wow! Amazing. A very different league for sure. Given that, Dan. Now you again. You 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 do so much with basketball, but you really do. Um, I've 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 looked you up. Can you tell me a little bit about the DME Academy that you helped co-found? So uh, let me just, this actually has a little bit to do with what happened in China, because when I, when I, uh, when I went to Shanghai Sharks, uh, I signed a three-year contract. And then after two years, I was fired. Uh, and uh, Yao Ming was, who did not fire me, I was fired actually by the, uh, by the Chinese uh, city government that actually kind of uh, they actually have uh, jurisdiction over teams that are actually owned. So no team is actually completely privately owned. And uh, wow. but at any rate, I got I got fired and uh, Yao honored my contract. So he was going to pay me for that third year. Well, I came home. I'm sitting at home and I'm collecting a check and I'm bored out of my mind. And I can't go get a job because whatever job I get, because I'm under contract, I need to, uh, you know, I, I would be working for free because they would, there's an offset in the deal. So uh, here I am bored. Mm -hmm. And my brother, who was, uh, my, I, like I mentioned, my college uh, teammate, he's in business. And uh, so we had a, a, a big, huge warehouse that was uh, about 47,000 square feet, just said, sitting uh, empty. And uh, we just said, we'd always wanted to do this. And so we said, why don't we just, you know, build a court in there and uh, we'll start training some kids. Well, we built one court, then we build a second court, then we build a third court, then we, we put a strength and condition. And, and, and that's how this whole thing started because I was bored. Uh, we had, a, uh, I was, I had a check coming. So wow. uh, I was in pretty good shape for the, for that year. And we just said, let's build this. And we started to build it. And we had no idea where the thing was going to go. And all of a sudden, when you have a facility like that, people start approaching you with opportunities. And so one thing led yeah. to another. And, and now we have a fully functioning, uh, you know, uh, academic and sports academy. Um, we have uh, two major facilities. We've got an ice rink. We've got figure skating. We've got ice hockey. Uh, we've got, wow. you know, uh, we've got a middle school, high school, a postgraduate academy, and we've got players and, uh, and students from all over the world, including Australia, by the way. Wow. Well, I can definitely wow. attest to that. I can definitely attest to that, Dan, because, you know, I go there every day in this academy and I'll tell you, it's state of the arts. I encourage anybody when everybody to go Google DME sports and look at some of those facilities and the whole, the whole thing there, it, it's phenomenal. It's, it's like nothing I've ever seen before. And I've seen a lot of places, the academies, it's nothing like anything I've ever seen before. So, awesome. Oh, well, that's I, something. I left there about an hour ago. Matter of fact, I, I was Sorry. on the uh, treadmill when you, when you call CJ, <laughs> I, I, was at, I was at DME. <laughs> 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 I always have a perfect time in real. Wow, that's that's a great story. Oh, it's look good. Google it, Brian. You're a Googler. No, Google I've, I've 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 Googled it. I've seen oh, okay, it. Okay, see okay. that is see that Dan. I'll be honest with you. That is something that 
I've always wanted to do here, to be honest with you, is to create mm-hmm. academy an academy. Because I, I personally, I, I'm a coach, I'm a development coach, and I've, mm-hmm. I ran an academy here, the Maribyrnong Sports Academy, and it became probably the most successful academy here in Australia, but it was the first time that a school that they've invested into a sports, a sporting school. And I ran the basketball program and we turned out several players and, you know, national team players and college players and things like that. And uh, right now I'm in that same kind of frame of mind to, to kind of do something on my own. Um, But yeah, so my hat's off to you, man. That's a, that's a great story. That's, that's an inspirational story. For someone hey, like me. Well, hey, Brian, you put a put a financial package together, and I'll come as a consultant. Okay, <laughs> that sounds good. Okay, <laughs> it's I I I'd encourage you to do it because you know even now, uh, I mean, there aren't that many businesses that are in that space, and uh, there's so much room for growth in the sport of basketball in Australia. You know, I've been there a couple times. Yes. I played uh, my Shanghai teams have played in tournaments against some of the teams there. Uh, and I think obviously Australian football is huge and, and, and rugby and, and all the rest of it, but uh, there's so much room yeah. for, uh, for growth in the sport of basketball. And I think it's still a wide open uh, area. So uh, Brian, I would encourage you to do that. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm uh, I'm I'm doing it. Trust me, I'm going. <laughs> well, I'm going to do it. I because uh, like I said, it's it's always been a a dream of mine because because I, I I do so much. I've been involved personally. I've been involved with development of players um, for the last twenty five years. Um, so just with, with that, and again, I get a I have a great joy in helping young players be successful or try and be successful, not just in the sport, but also. Mm-hmm. So in life, so that's again, and, and when I see stories like yours and and the inspiration behind it, well, yeah, yeah, that that just motivates me even more to want to get it done. So, no, well, thank you, Dan. I want to talk a little bit more, if we could, about when you were in the was it the G League then or the developmental league? What were they calling it when you were there? With the it was called the D League. It was called the D League. Okay, developmental league. Okay. Yeah, they were the you were the Fenders, right? LA Defenders, the the Los Angeles Defenders. Yeah. yeah, and I spent four years with the Lakers. The first three, I headed up their uh, developmental team, the D League team, and then my last year there, I was the uh, advanced scout. Uh, so I went out ahead of the team and, and did all those uh, the uh, the uh, the advanced planning for the next opponent. So, uh, but. Uh, yeah, we were the the LA uh, the the Lakers were the first team, uh, first NBA team to actually purchase uh, a developmental league team. Wow, how smart was wow. that? Yeah. Well, they were smart, and uh, the reason that I got that job was because of my uh, experience with Phil and with Tex Winter, and because they ran a, a pretty complex system. The triple post or otherwise called the triangle offense. Um, Mm -hmm. And I was one of the, there aren't very many people uh, in actually in the world, uh, let alone the U S that, that understand that offense and and that know how to teach it. And so I got hired on that basis. And of course that's the system uh, that we employed and, uh, and that we ran with the, the D league team. Hey Dan, uh, CJ here. I got uh, we got about five and a half minutes left, so I just want to ask you, um, who, what's what's your favorite player that you worked with that went on to do great things? Well, my favorite—I I don't know who my favorite player of all time is because I've got so many, but I, I was especially fond of Scottie Pippen. I coached him, you know, for for two years with the uh, with the Trailblazers. And I yeah. just had such a great admiration and we got to be close friends. Um, I, I'd say I had a lot of admiration for Steve, Cor- Steve Kerr, who I also coached in Portland. Um, Zach Randolph was always, I was always very close with him because we both entered the NBA the same year. He is a rookie uh, and uh, I as a rookie coach. Uh, 
So those are three. Arvita Sabonis was a was a pleasure. Those were all trailblazers. Mm. And I, you know, so, you know, I, I had a special affection because that was my first NBA team. Um, mm. Uh, with the Lakers, okay. yeah. uh, uh, with with the Lakers, obviously, um, uh, you know, Kobe was. Uh, I had a relationship with Kobe. Uh, you know, so did a lot of other people. But I, uh, you know, Kobe uh, had uh, grown up in Italy, and uh, you know, I'm a dual citizen, Italian and uh, uh, American. So uh, we used to talk about Italy and talk about some of his experiences there. So I. Uh, Derek Fisher, I had a lot of respect for Derek. And um, so, uh, you know, who, who did I, you know, these are all NBA players. Uh, but uh, I guess the thing that impressed me, you know, taking a guy like Pippen, the thing that impressed me was his, in his intelligence level and his ability. He's the only player I've ever known that can dominate a game from the defensive end of the floor. Now I know there was others, obviously right. Bill Russell was one, but I didn't ever have that pleasure, but Scotty Pippen was able to actually not control. Well, I guess control and dominate a game from the defensive end. And I don't know if everybody, uh, wow. you know, I don't know if people really uh, give him enough credit. Sure. They know he was a good defender, but I don't know if they know just how much control he had of a team defense while he was on the court. Yeah, he, he's always been one of my favorites. Always. <laughs> he's, a good, yeah. he's a good man. Good man. Ah. Oh, yeah. Wow, well, that's interesting. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, you had some? I got, I got one last question for you. One last question. question for you, Dan. All right, man. Uh, and this will be a quick question. All right. Given your, given your sure. experience, and, and, and I, I mean, given your experience um, of coaching professional being involved in college, being involved with younger players, what would be your preference as a as a coach? What would be your 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 first preference? Would it be development at the high school level, at the college level, or would you look at the NBA level or professional levels? Well, you know, I really enjoyed the highest level because it stimulates your mind, uh, you know, on your X's and O's. Uh, on your strategies mm -hmm. and on your competitive juices when you, you know when you're an assistant coach and I never had the pleasure of being a head coach in the NBA but when you're an assistant coach you're given uh, you know a certain number of opponents well when I was doing it uh, we split the opponents the NBA opponents amongst the three assistants and so you're given nine or ten opponents and you're responsible for the game plan for the preparation for you know, just how do you beat who you're going against? And in those days when I was yeah. doing that, okay. there were some great systems to go against. You had Pat Riley in uh, Miami. You had Jerry Sloan in Utah. Uh, you had Larry Brown uh, in, in Philadelphia. You had, you had Jeff Van oh. Gundy in New York. You had, uh, you had uh, just, uh, you had Phil Jackson in Los Angeles. Uh, it, the, the list goes, goes on and on. You had great systems that you had to find ways and then great players that you were trying to find ways to control. How do you control a Ray Allen coming off uh, a single double action? How do you, you know, you know, how do you control a Shaquille O'Neal on post catches? I mean, these are great challenges, man, man. Well, Dan, with that, man, I want to thank you. We're going to have to wrap it up right about here, but definitely thank you for being on. Yeah. And, wow, very interesting. Uh, you know, learned some things that we didn't know. And, man, this is great. And one, thank you for being on the show today. And, and Brian and Rick, thank you guys for being here as well, man, again. And uh, we'd like to thank our fans for tuning in to ABA 101. Dan, you take care, man, and we'll be back in touch for sure. Dan, thanks, man. Thank, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thanks, really everybody. Appreciate I appreciate it. I Had appreciate it. All right, Thanks. guys. Everyone have a good one. <laughs> Take care. The American Basketball Association is the largest pro league in the world. Some great opportunities for team ownership are available, and the cost may surprise you. If you've ever thought about team ownership in a pro league, give us the opportunity to help make it a reality. Reach out to us for more info. 
for US Patents at www.abaliveaction.com. In Australia, go to www.abaleagueaustralia.com. Hi guys, CJ here. We currently have a few positions available for relationship managers. If you would like the opportunity to work in sports marketing, this could be it. The ABA is the largest pro league in the world and partnered with the AAU representing over 700,000 athletes around the world. Building business relationships and helping bring new audiences to every business we're working with is the goal. You're not limited to one state or region. Businesses partnering with sports is always a win-win for the community. Sound interesting? Then drop us an email and give more information at jobs at aba101.club. And we'll get back to you right away. Well, that's going to do it for this week. Remember, you can keep up with every episode by subscribing via our website. Follow us on social media and tell your friends about us. Next week, new guests, more basketball tips, more basketball stories about the game we all love. Till then, be safe and keep your eyes on the ball.